Class number four, Traveling Waves. Better an informal definition of waves. Let's show some waves. Not those waves. The slinky clearly shows two types of waves, the transverse and the longitudinal. These are traveling waves in one dimension. These are very familiar transverse traveling waves in two dimensions. And these are some serious transverse traveling waves in two dimensions. The atomic bomb allows to see a longitudinal traveling wave in three dimensions. Some waves are not visible, like sound. These are three-dimensional longitudinal waves, but they can only be heard. There are other waves that are not visible or hearable. For example, the electromagnetic waves in the microwave band. They're traveling, they're 3D, and they're transversal. Heat radiation is also an invisible electromagnetic wave. So are the black lights, which emit ultraviolet radiation. X-rays are also electromagnetic waves that are invisible. Most of the electromagnetic spectrum is invisible, except for a very small band called the visible spectrum. And then you've probably heard of gravitational waves. Gravitational disturbances travel as waves, and big ones, like the merger of these two white dwarfs in the animation, may be detected thousands of light years away. Are they transverse or longitudinal? I won't even dare to comment. This keeps getting weird. Electrons, which has always been called, and we keep calling them, particles may also behave as waves. They show interference patterns, which is a wave thing, as will become clear when we deal with the fracture further on. Understanding waves opens the door to a whole new world of knowledge. Well, time to get down to business. Taking the simplest case, which is the wave on a string, and considering all the angles are small, the forces that act upon the small section of size delta x are forces acting horizontally are both approximately equal to the tension, so they cancel each other. The ratio of the vertical forces at x equals the slope, or the partial derivative there, respect to x. But since the horizontal force equals the tension T, the expression simplifies to this one. Same can be said for the vertical forces at x plus delta x. The total force delta F acting on a piece of string is then. But delta F accelerates the mass of a small piece of string delta x. So, Newton's second law goes mass, which is the linear density by delta x, multiplied by the acceleration, which is the second derivative of y respect to time. Replacing delta f and rearranging, taking it to the limit when delta x tends to zero, and we get the wave equation. I see no wave there. Patience, patience, it's coming. Another simple example of waves are those in a transmission line for electrical signals. For example, the coaxial TV line. It may be approximated to a circuit like this, where the C's and the L's are the inductances and capacitance per unit of length. Now we apply Kirchhoff law to the corners on the node at x. 
the current coming into the node minus the one going out equals the one charging the capacitor. But the current in a capacitor is the integral in time of its voltage drop divided by the inductance. Here, since the inductance is distributed, it will be L by delta X and the voltage drop the minus X derivative by the same delta X. Kirchhoff at the node takes the expression. The current into the capacitor simplifies after canceling the deltas. But this current is the rate at which the charge accumulates and equals the product of the capacitance by the time derivative of the voltage. Since the capacitance is also distributed, it will be C by delta X. Rearranging and doing the length the delta X tends to zero, we obtain this expression. Finally, taking the time derivative on both numbers, we get the wave equation. And where is the wave? It's in there. Just wait. Another case is a little more involved, but cannot be skipped, is that of a long pipe with a compressible fluid inside and a piston. Say a force pulls the piston. The fluid in its vicinity is rarefied. The rarefied fluid pulls that in its vicinity and the pull propagates. The force now pushes the piston and compresses the fluid. The compressed fluid pushes that in its vicinity and the push propagates. There. The wave that's generated is a sound wave. And the size of the compressions and decompressions that happen within a wave is the acoustic pressure. Now that's the wave. Good. Stay with me. The wave produces displacement in the fluid. Let u in x, t be that displacement of a slice at the distance x from the piston at time t. If u increases with x, the slices will expand with x, so the acoustic pressure p sub a will decrease in proportion to this expansion. In math words, the acoustic pressure equals the product of B by the minus partial derivative of the displacement U with respect to F, where B is a constant. The total force acting on a slice is the product of its cross-sectional area multiplied by the pressure difference across its width. Replacing the acoustic pressure by the expression above, we get this one. Now we can put the increment of x derivative in terms of the second derivative. Applying Newton's second law, the resulting force is the mass of the slice by its acceleration. Now we can replace the delta f by its expression. And after doing all the cancelling, we get the wave equation. That B. Yeah, we need to talk about that B. Let us bring back the equation where it first appeared. The acoustic pressure is the increment above the undisturbed pressure. Stepping back the partial derivative, it is the quotient of the displacement difference from the inner side of the slice to its outer side over the undisturbed size of the slide. Multiplying numerator and denominator by the cross-sectional area, we get the relative volume expansion. But that equal the incrementing pressure, right? Isolating B Taking it to the limit when delta V tends to zero, this is the definition for the isentropic bulk modulus of a fluid. Isentropic means constant entropy, 
which is an adiabatic process that it's also reversible. I'm afraid I just opened a can of worms. I know, the term autodynamic jargon sounds intimidating. But what it's saying is that expansion and compressions in a wave must be adiabatic. Because there's no time for heat transfers that could keep the temperature constant. And where's the wave? Well, here's the long-awaited answer to that. Time to solve the wave equation. We will follow the approach of D'Alembert back in 1717. He found that any function f in x minus ct or g in x plus ct satisfied the wave equation. You can check it, it's easy. It does. So the general solution was u in xt equals the combination of both, the sum of both. The solution describes a wave of some shape traveling to the right plus another one traveling to the left, both at a speed equal to c. The actual expression for f and g will depend on the boundary and or initial conditions. For instance, say that you know the initial shape of the string. That is to know that y in x comma zero is a certain function in x and that the initial velocities are zero everywhere no motion before zero if that's so then f and g must be the same except for a constant a constant would mean the entire string being displaced up or down which makes no sense for any other value than zero so this could be the solution for t less than zero, the string is spinned into the shape fx. At table one, the pins are removed and the, and the shape starts changing. At t equal two, and at t equal three, they are already on their way to the left and to the right. Look at that! The ways were there! I told you! Let us try now a boundary condition. y in 0, comma t equal a known function of time, combined with an initial condition that says that the string is at rest. Therefore, there can be no traveling away from the right. It was at rest all the way to infinity, right? So g in x plus ct, this time, is 0. Since for x equals zero, y must move with function t, then the particular solution to this case is this one. Wait, what's that t minus x over c? Wasn't the Lombard solution something in x minus ct? Sebastian, try it. You'll find that function in t minus x on the c is a solution as well, only that this one becomes nicely equal function in t for x equals zero. The shape of the time function spreads on x. However, the wave equation in one dimension cannot tell the whole story. What about ripples in water? sound waves or electromagnetic waves out in the open. Remember that great mathematician whose name sounded like Euler? Well, he came up with a wave equation for three special dimensions. About a century after that, the expression condensed to this one. The symbol that looks like an inverted delta is called del or nabla and it's a vector operator. It works just like a vector, and so the dot product with itself renders a scalar operator. Familiar? <laughs> Hence, the dot product of the dels is del square, the Laplacian operator. Beautiful! This is mathematical poetry. 
I must agree with the bastion artistic sensitivity, but it's not just beautiful. It can be expressed not just in Cartesian, but in any coordinate system. For instance, in a spherical coordinates, the Dell operator looks like this. So when the wave equation is expressed using the Dell operator, it's valid for any coordinate system. Here's the Laplacian operator in spherical coordinates. Oh, sh**. Uh, sorry, I can make it any easier for you. But look at it this way. What makes it difficult makes it good in a resume. <laughs> Consider now, for example, the sound waves of fireworks exploding in the air. It sends out spherical waves, and since symmetry allows no dependence on theta or phi, in this case, the wave equation becomes only a function of r. And the solution coming out of the magic hat is... What about g in r plus ct? Isn't that a solution as well? Ah, uh, Sebastian, you just love those gotcha questions. The solution in r minus ct represents a wave with a shape f propagating outward at a speed c from a disturbance that happened at t equals zero. And as it moves away from the origin, its amplitude decreases in proportional to its radius distance. A solution in R plus CT would represent a wave that had been propagating inward from infinity since T and minus infinity, that has been growing in amplitude while moving towards the origin to arrive at T equals zero. So, Every firework that explodes in the sky is a wave that came from infinity. Good bedtime story, isn't it? Does a loudspeaker sends out spherical waves too? Coming from you, it is probably a rhetorical question. Since you surely know that the sound is more intense when you're in front of the speaker than when you're behind. Waves are not spherical, but their propagation is still radial. A more general solution would be the spherical wave solution modulated by g, a function of theta and phi only. We need to test, however, that it satisfies the wave equation. Let's do it. The Laplacian of our product is the first factor by the Laplacian of the second plus the second by the Laplacian of the first, and that equals 1 over c squared by the second derivative. Now let's do the time derivatives. Since g is not a function of time, it comes out as a constant. From the spherical wave, we already know that these two terms are equal. Then what's left must be zero. But since f is not zero, certainly, then the Laplacian of g must be zero. If it is a solution, then g must comply with the Laplacian being zero. However, it sounds very cool if instead of you saying that g must be that, you say that it's the harmonic function. Okay, have we proven this beyond any doubt? Right? No, yes. yeah. 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 Well, guess what? There's a step in that process that is wrong. <gasps> yeah. Same happened back when I was a sophomore. Proving the same solution of radio propagation was part of a big homework. I had developed the proof I just showed, and everyone in the study group bought it. Late to that session was Alejandro Cabo. He showed up after the rest of the group was gone. I was bringing him up to date, and fast learner as he was, we were flying over every item of the homework until we hit this one. 
He said he didn't understand. Cabo not understanding a simple piece of math? That was weird. I went through it again and again with the same result. Then it hit me. Cabo was a humble genius. He didn't want to humiliate me by saying it was wrong. He was hoping that I would notice the problem without he saying it explicitly. Cabo, we have no time for this. Where did I screw up? Only then was that his finger pointed to this equation. The Laplacian of a product functions is not that, but this other expression. This term was missing in my equation. However, he said, explained, F depends only on R, so the gradient can only point radially. On the other hand, G does not depend on R. Thus, the gradient has no radial component. So, that dot product there is zero. Now, it has to be proven. Cobb is today an internationally recognized theoretical physics. He deals with elementary particles, string theory, and stuff I cannot even begin to grasp. One of my favorite things to brag about is that of being his friend. That's it? No physics? Just math? Here's some physics for you. That of the amplitude depending on one or R could have been inferred from the conservation of the wave energy. From symmetry considerations, we can assure that if the disturbance is coming out of a point, there's no reason for propagating in any particular direction other than the radial. The wave must carry energy, for it produces displacement from the equilibrium positions. Once the wave passes, it all returns to equilibrium. Therefore, no energy is left behind. All the work done by the force at the source spreads in space with the wave. The area in which the energy spreads goes with r squared and its density with 1 over r squared. Finally, since the energy density goes with u squared, then the amplitude <laughs> goes with 1 over r. Question, question. Okay, Sebastian, hit me. Amplitude involves some sort of displacement. What if the radius becomes smaller than that? Oh, you got me, Sebastian. Look, the wave equation is based on the linearity of the response to the disturbance. The elongation in a string had to be small enough so that the sand could be replaced by the slope, remember? The acoustic pressure in the sound wave must be much smaller than the air pressure. The wave equation itself is only valid for radiuses way greater than the displacement. That of the energy going with the square of the amplitude? <laughs> it's true only for linear responses, condition that will not hold in the nearness of the source. Some philosophy, <laughs> a point source, is one of those abstractions that simplify the system and the study by eliminating details that we don't need to address. That's it. Well, it's time to recapitulate. Here's what had been covered about traveling waves. Waves can be transversal or longitudinal and may propagate in one, two, or three dimensions. They're transverse mechanical waves, like those on a string or a membrane. They're longitudinal waves in gases, liquids, and solids. These are sound waves. They're electromagnetic waves radio, microwave, infrared light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. The wave equation in one dimension is this one, whenever the response is proportional to a disturbance. D'Alembert's solution was one wave to the right and one wave to the left. Euler's wave equation in 3D could be expressed using the Laplacian operator. 
The solution when the disturbance comes from a point source was this one. Any spreads on the expanding area proportional to R squared. And this is consistent with the amplitude being proportional to 1 over R. Also, we covered amplitude attenuation due to damping mechanism. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> We didn't cover that. Well, it's that time. Time for the quiz. The answers can be found after the end of the video. Say if it's true or false. And for this, I'll be wearing my poker face and speaking with my poker voice. Waves in a string are always transverse, cannot be longitudinal. Sound waves are longitudinal. Longitudinal waves can only happen in gases, never in liquids and solids. Radio waves and microwaves are transverse, but all forms of lights are longitudinal. The solution for the wave equation F in X minus CT is the math description of a wave moving in the minus X direction. The Laplacian operator is the dot product of the del vectors. Del operating on a function is called the gradient. Then the Laplacian of F equals the dot product of the gradients. Functions complying with the Laplacian being zero are called harmonic functions. The Laplacian operator expressed in spherical coordinates is the spherical wave may be expressed in terms of x, y, and z as follows. Okay, next. Number two. One of the main parameters of transmission lines for electrical signals is the characteristic impedance zeta sub zero, which is defined as the ratio of the amplitudes of the voltage wave over that of the current wave. Find the expression for zeta zero in terms of L and C, inductance and capacitance for unit of length respectively. Number three, consider two dimensional waves, like those in a drum membrane. Prove that the amplitudes far from the source go with one over the square root of rho using energy conservation arguments. Number four, there are waves in the open three-dimensional space that keep their amplitude constants as they propagate in only one direction. These are called plane waves, examples of which is the light from the sun. Explain why. Number five, Einstein theory of relativity states that, oh my God, Relativity? Don't panic. We are not going deep into that or anything. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Why do a solid, perfectly rigid bar would be in violation of this? Hmm. And number six. A string phone allows hearing a whisper many feet away. Why? Traveling waves propagate in open spaces, but in the next video we will show the magic that happens when waves are excited within boundaries. The standing waves. Why magic? Because it relates to something that touches our soul in a way that has no better explanation. Music. Subscribe to the channel. after you have answers of your own is that you can take a peek at mine. Here they are. Let's see if they're true or false. Essentially, a string is no different than a slinky, so both can propagate there. So it's false. Sound is a longitudinal wave. True.
The longitudinal wave can propagate in any elastic media, and though solids and liquids may seem uncompressible, they are not. It's false. All electromagnetic waves are transverse, so it's false. F in minus CT represents a wave moving in the plus X direction. The minus sign of the CT may mislead you, but uh, same as in analytic geometry, the line moved to the left with plus B and to the right with minus B. Remember? It's false. The Laplacian is the dot product of the Dells. That's true. The Laplacian of a function, the dot product of the gradients, let's see. I don't think so. Functions complying with the Laplacian being zero are called harmonic functions. Oh, yes. The Laplacian operator is stress in spherical coordinates is all that, so it's false. Yes, there's no problem with this expression, so it's true. Problem number one. Find the expression for the zeta sub zero in terms of L and C, which are the inductance and capacitance per unit of length respectively. Let's begin. The voltage applies an inductor is the product of its inductance, L by delta X in this case, by the time derivative of the current going through it. Isolating the quotient delta V or delta X and taking it to the limit when delta X goes to zero, we have this. Now we bring from our short time memory, the solution we have found for the voltage wave. To replace V in the equation and then take the derivative. Now we integrate the derivative of I to get I. We do the same to the right hand side of the equation. We simplify and isolating the quotient V over I, that's the theta sub zero, the characteristic impedance of the line. I have seen that before. Of course you have. It resembles the characteristic impedance of the LRC circuit, only that in this case, L and C are the inductance and capacitance, say, per foot or per meter of cable. Is there a zeta zero for the waves in a string? Sebastian, that was supposed to be my line. The concept of characteristic impedance extends to any media that can propagate a wave. The product of the voltage by the current of the wave at any point in the line renders the power being transferred, and their quotient was the definition of zeta sub zero, which we could prove that it was equal to square root of L over C. In a string, the product of the force by the velocity dy dt at any point along it also renders the power being transferred, and the quotient may be defined zeta zero as well. In the same manner, it can be proved that it equals square root of mu, that's the linear density, by the tension t. In a sound wave, the product of the pressure by the volume compression at any point renders the power being transferred and the quotient may also be defined as zeta sub zero, which in this case equals the square root of rho sub zero, which is the density, by B, the bulk modulus. Zeta sub zero have a role when we deal with reflection and refraction in the coming video. Problem number two, consider two-dimensional waves and prove that far from the source, the amplitude go with one over square root of rho, which is the radial distance, using only energy conservation arguments. Let's begin. For reasons of symmetry, there can be no propagation along z or phi. 
so the wave energy can only move radially. But where's the displacement in Z? Yes, Sebastian, but no propagation. Same as in the case of waves in a string. The motion was in Y, but the propagation was only in X. The energy from the disturbance at a distance r from the source will spread, not on the surface of a sphere this time, but on a circumference. So the linear energy density would go with 1 over rho. Since far from the source, the energy density is proportional to the square of the amplitude, then the amplitude will go with 1 over the square root of rho. Proven beyond any reasonable doubt. Sebastian, don't overdo it. Problem number three. There are waves in the open three-dimensional space that keep their amplitude constant as they propagate in our only one direction. These are called plane waves, examples of which is the light from the sun. Explain why. That's a trick question. The light from the sun is a spherical wave. Oh my god. No, Sebastian, it's not a trick question. The light from the sun is as spherical as any wave coming from a spherical source. There's a big but. The distance from the sun to the earth is r equal almost 93 million miles. Diameter of the earth is 8,000 miles. The amplitude difference at a planet scale is that, 10 to minus 4. The arc subtended by the Earth is d over r, which is less than 10 to minus 4 radians, or less than 0 0.006 degrees. And that would be the maximum propagation direction difference at a planet scale. In a human scale, then multiply that by the human to planet ratio, which is 1.4 per 10 to minus 7. The light from the sun may be considered a very plain wave. Problem number four. Einstein's theory of relativity states that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Why do a solid and perfectly rigid bar would be in violation of this? Easy! The speed of sound goes with the square root of the oh bulk modulus. If perfectly rigid, then that will take it to infinity, right? That's correct, Sebastian, but I would like some more physics. For instance, consider an observer looking at the far end of the bar while in contact with the end nearest to him. Like that. Now we push the bar and the observer might feel the touch before he can see it. But here's what really happens, no matter what rigid the bar may look. The push will propagate at the speed of sound, which is a lot slower than the speed of light. That's it. Finally, problem number five. A string phone allows hearing a whisper many feet away. Why? Well, here it is. When you shout to the open air, the power of your voice spreads in an area that grows with a square of the distance to your mouth. The farther away is the one you're shouting to, the greater the power you must put to your shout. On the other hand, when you whisper into the can that has a tense string attached, the power of your voice excites a wave in that string that will travel through it without spreading. So, in absence of damping, your voice could be carried through any length of string. Uh, however, in real life, wave damping is always present. No matter if the wave is in one, two or three dimensions, the material media always taxes the energy it propagates. Are those waves in the string phone transversal or longitudinal? I'm going to leave that one for you to figure out. This is it. That's all, folks.